He ran the biggest airport theft operation in North America. He had everything, had it all. That's the only way to describe it. For years, police were fooled by his ingenious system. He is a mastermind because he stayed under the radar. You gotta respect him for that. He sought inspiration for his crimes in a Buddhist temple. He had thousand dollar bills in frames posted on the walls and he would pray to the money. And made over seven million dollars. Find out how he did it next on Masterminds. Pearson Airport in Toronto, Canada, has some of the largest cargo terminals in the world. The biggest is the size of two football fields. It's just a monster facility, all computerized, and uh, uh, every day cargo comes in and out of that uh, location. Millions upon millions of dollars of goods every day arrive in the morning, evening, and night, and it is nonstop. If you wanted to steal within that cargo facility, there's a lot of product. It's like walking into a large candy store. The candy store was protected by a force of over 100 police officers on full-time airport duty. But in the late 80s, authorities discovered entire skids of high-end products, some worth up to a half million dollars, were disappearing. The cargo that was missing was staggering. They had every Kodak camera that was destined for Toronto area for the Christmas season. We had Nike products, including their merchandising, their clothing. We had the entire spring collection of Banana Republic stolen. We're looking at $6 million worth of product missing and unaccounted for. If it wasn't nailed down, it was being taken. Police formed a task force to discover how the thieves were bypassing the airport's heavy security. Everything is secure on that perimeter. You got a wall or high-stake fence with barbed wire. There are video cameras monitoring it and everyone can see video cameras posted nearby. There are also security guards posted. They view your tag, check its validity, and then allow you access. But in spite of these precautions, cargo kept disappearing, and years of police investigations went nowhere. There are a number of difficulties inherent in investigating any occurrence at the airport. Typically they call us saying we can't find merchandise in our vast warehouse and now we believe it's stolen. Can you investigate the theft from a week ago? Police found the closed world of the air cargo workers impossible to penetrate. The employees we spoke to were very guarded with some of their remarks. Those people have worked together for such a long time that anybody that tries or attempts to infiltrate those groups is looked upon as an outsider. If we are doing surveillance at a mall, we could blend in with thousands of other cars. At the airport, it's not like that. But their investigation did lead police to one conclusion. The thefts were the work of an organized crime ring operating inside the airport. The reason why we thought it was a large number of people was you needed to know all of the ins and outs of the cargo operations, the flight landings the way bills, the information that came on those way bills. You had to know people in security, you had to know supervisors, managers, you had to know drivers. So all of these factored into our idea of that it was a large group of people stealing the stuff out of cargo. But the police were wrong. The thefts weren't the product of a large criminal organization. They were the work of a lone truck driver. Hoa Lam Ong had found a way to bypass security, steal over $7 million in cargo, and sell it worldwide. The question is, how did he do it? Hoa Lam Ong emigrates from Vietnam to Toronto, Canada in the late 1980s. He came with $50 in his pocket when he arrived in Canada. But Ong has a burning desire to become rich, hidden beneath an easygoing charm. He always was kind of like a, uh, a center point whenever you would see him meeting other people. Uh, he seemed to stick out and he had a uh, bubbly personality. In the tight-knit Asian community, he makes friends easily and earns the nickname Smiley. He soon meets a fellow Vietnamese immigrant, Teresa Pang, at his local Buddhist temple. They met through uh, a mutual friend. 
Sparks flew, and next thing you know, they were married. Smiley moves into Teresa's apartment and adopts her teenage son, Benny. Teresa worked at Golden Jet Freight Forty out of Pearson Airport. They're responsible for shipping property uh, from the cargo facilities. She helps Smiley get work with Best Choice, another shipping company. His job is to pick up goods from the airport and deliver them to businesses throughout the city. But it pays only $400 a week. To realize his dream of making it big, he decides to break the law. Everybody's human. Everybody's at their threshold. Um, what point do you break? How bad do you need the money? That's what it really comes down to. Smiley calculates that if he can keep even a fraction of the merchandise that passes through his hands, he'll be a very rich man. He spends months trying to gain access to the goods inside the cargo facility. Within cargo, you must display your pass and you must have it on you at all times. The problem is, Smiley's pass limits him to a tiny area of the warehouse. He realizes the only way to steal the goods is to get the cargo workers on his side. He had a way of dealing with people. You gotta be able to be smooth, you gotta be able to have the gift the gab. He's interacting with employees all around the airport and developing relationships, sizing them up. Smiley gets to know the guys and quickly identifies who's hard up for cash. Over a period of time, he would offer them gifts. He would hand them a box of frozen lobster and say, hey, you know, the next time I see you, maybe you can help me out. So he'd come in for a legitimate load. He'd pick up three or four skids in his truck. Then he would approach an employee within the cargo facility, ask them if they could throw something extra on his truck, and he could supply them with some extra money. Smiley invests every dollar he has to kickstart his cargo theft operation. But now that he has the goods, he needs a way to sell them. In the beginning, when he started working, Smiley would search people out for the goods. He started off small and was selling it through different friends, different fences, as we call them. That could be people that own flea markets, that could be people that own computer companies, clothing companies, various merchandise stores. He had to have all those connections within his community. And that's where his empire started to grow. Using his profits, he starts drawing in more accomplices. Smiley carries a wad of cash with him. 50s, 100s, people referred to him as always having a lot of money. And that would allow for instant payment for property. But Smiley's ability to buy everything cargo workers have to offer soon creates a serious problem. Some of the property is very difficult to move in high volume. It's quite difficult to get rid of 80 pairs of pants within a day unless you've got a clothing buyer and there's not quite as many of those people as there are for electronic companies that are willing to buy 80 of a particular item. But help is close at hand. Through her shipping job, Teresa has access to detailed information about income and cargo. Teresa was very important to Smiley. She would tell him the flight that it came in on, the amount that it's worth, which area that this product would be brought into. The two of them were like two peas in a pod. They bounced ideas off of one another. They knew that they had to survive together in order for this operation to continue. Smiley would look at his schedules and figure out who was working, what time the product was coming in. So he was very keyed in on those factors. Smiley is soon able to pay up to $10,000 for the most valuable merchandise. Then it just began to grow and grow, and it was like a snowball rolling down the hill. It just, uh, it, it was incredible. But this success draws the attention of the airport's organized crime gangs. The message given out by a lot of these guys was that you mess with us and life won't be the same for you. They demand a piece of the action. To keep them on side, Smiley pays them off. Now free to steal with impunity, 
he turns over his distribution network to stepson Benny Pang. He had to get some people around him that he trusted that could help him move that product and make extra money. Benny was utilized by his stepfather as just a pawn in the scheme of things. To make the business look legitimate, Smiley prints professional looking invoices and business cards for Benny. A lot of these companies thought they were actually buying a legitimate product. Benny proves to be an excellent salesman, but even he can't move all of Smiley's growing inventory. The business was being overwhelmed. His ability to bring the goods in was much better than Mr. Pang's ability to move it out, and it was essentially stacking up. Because renting public storage space is risky, he buys two suburban houses. Smiley used them as a storage facility for all the product that was being stolen out of Pearson cargo warehouses. When his new neighbors meet him, Smiley turns on the charm. They acknowledged that they had seen some of this activity, but Smiley was very friendly, and he said, I'm, you know, shipper or receiver, and they bought into that, so they never questioned whether or not he was involved in some sort of illicit activity. Smiley now expands his operation to cover the entire airport. I guess they figured, you know, this stuff is selling. The more we can get, the more we can sell. These guys were just getting bigger and bigger. Smiley on is at the top of his game, making millions. But a random break and enter will soon threaten to bring him down. Smiley Ong's cargo theft operation is now North America's largest. But he's struggling to sell his enormous inventory. He turns to his Buddhist faith for inspiration and flies in a monk from China. Both houses had a prayer room and these rooms were immaculate. They didn't have any stolen property in them, simply areas for prayer. Prosperity is certainly one thing that you pray for. They had thousand dollar bills in frames posted on the walls and they would pray to the money. Smiley's prayers are answered by the internet. He instructs Benny to set up an account with eBay. It's a dream for anybody selling stolen property. And basically, it's a license to print money. It's also a dream for a seller who wants to hide his identity. When they registered their name with eBay, they had the credit cards that didn't belong to them. They had addresses that were fictitious. Smiley now creates an eBay assembly line. For the first time, he can quickly move products like cameras and clothes that are hard to sell door to door. Benny monitors the bidding. Teresa is the shipping department. He had everything, had it all. It was a mail order cost code, what it was. That's the only way to describe it. There was 19,000 transactions in total. We're talking a lot of checks and a lot of cash. We're talking about thousands of dollars of goods per day. He had a lot of money, he did, and he didn't show it uh, by the way he dressed or what he drove. By day, he continues to keep a low profile, working his connections at the airport. But by night, Smiley hits the casinos to launder his cash. To launder money at a casino, you put down a couple thousand dollars. You might lose three or four hundred dollars that night, but once you go to reclaim your money, the money's already washed, uh, you'll come back out with uh, twenty dollar bills and fifty dollar bills. Smiley also makes sure his business contacts at the airport are kept happy. He used to bring people out to strip bars and would pay for their night out. And they thought he was the best guy in the world. He ran a well-oiled machine. It was almost like a corporation. And he managed to do it. And he managed to do it well. Thirteen years into the investigation, police are no closer to identifying the mastermind. They intensify their efforts by going undercover, but still can't determine when a crime is occurring. If you watch the cargo being loaded onto various trucks within that facility, you wouldn't be able to tell if it was actually being stolen right in front of your face or it was just business as usual. 
it's also nearly impossible to narrow down the list of suspects. On any given theft in the cargo facility, you'd have 300 suspects. But it just takes one mastermind to actually figure out a system and put their system in place. And once that system's in place, um, it takes investigators a long time to actually follow it. Smiley definitely stayed under the, uh, the radar of most investigative techniques. But then in November 2001, police finally get a break. Within a skid of cargo Smiley steals is a box of hard drives. As soon as the theft is reported, police enter the serial numbers of these hard drives into a new system designed to track stolen goods. Something gets stolen in Toronto, you put in the system and every police department in Canada has access to that and can check it. So, you know, be able to locate stolen property is so much easier. A week later, Benny Pang sells the stolen hard drives to a computer parts company. That computer company put them in their warehouse and on that very same weekend, that warehouse gets broken into. The thieves take the same hard drives that Smiley had stolen from the airport. Police discover that the product serial numbers from the computer company theft match the numbers from the airport theft. For the first time, police have traced some of the stolen goods. This was a huge, huge break in the case for us. We finally realized that we were going to be able to track where the product was being stolen from and where it was going. Police questioned the computer merchant whose warehouse had been robbed. We asked the owner, who are you purchasing these hard drives from? He indicated all he had was a pager number and a name of Joe. When investigators check the number, they discover it belongs to Benny Pang. And that was our first breakthrough to find out who actually was bringing these hard drives to these various computer companies. Police begin surveillance on Benny. The surveillance took us all across Toronto, and he'd be meeting people in parking lots, going to their houses. We knew he was the right player. The surveillance was quite intense. It led us to a lot. They open the garage door. It's a wall of property. We found out that the owner of the house was Mr. Smiley, Ho Alam Ong. But police hold off on making an arrest. We knew that we had to build a larger case to find out where the product was coming from, where it was going to, and we had to actually physically see that. Investigators follow Smiley to best choice. That was the key. We were ecstatic. We had waited so long for so many years, and we finally had our connection. Police prepare to take down the operation. But when they make their move, they'll be staggered by what they find. On December 13, 2001, they take down Benny at one of the storage houses. Benny Peng was surprised. He was just shocked. Now the police move on Smiley and Teresa. Teresa Peng, along with Smiley, opened the door, and they were standing there in their pajamas. They were very surprised. They realized that the jig was up. You could tell to their eyes that they look like two deers caught in the headlights of a, a large steamroller. Then proceeded to go in with the videotape, and uh, <laughs> that's when everybody's jaw hit the floor. In our wildest dreams, we never thought there was that much property there. You could hear people shouting, you need to come down and look at the room I'm in. And I was shouting, you need to come up and look at the room that I'm in, because every room is stacked with stolen property. That's so much property, they barely had room to move. The police are also staggered by the amount of cash they find. There was money everywhere. $80,000 in a Versace wallet. There was money hidden under the night table. There was money in Benny's room. The total value of currency that was recovered was in excess of a million. I believe it was $1.2 million. Smiley Ong and Teresa and Benny Pang are arrested on the charge of possessing stolen property. Before trial, Smiley agrees to plead guilty on the condition that Teresa and Benny are released. Paul M. Ong stepped up and acknowledged that he was fully responsible for the entire operation and he was the only one that was sentenced. Because he cooperates with police and forfeits over six million dollars in cash and property, master thief Smiley Ong gets a reduced sentence. 
In March 2004, he starts serving a two-year prison term. We cut the heart out of the operation. Since our arrests of Smiley's organization, we haven't had a major organized theft at Pearson Airport. He was well organized, he knew what he was doing. He was very determined and had a good business plan, probably a business plan that the Bank of Montreal would have approved if it was legitimate. Smiley is a mastermind because he managed to keep himself afloat and always stayed under the radar. You gotta respect him for that.